Warm welcome to everyone. And it's it's a bit of a shame we can't meet in person, uh, but probably for the better, considering how much pizza we usually consume. So it's uh, on the positive, eh? So um, for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome, and hopefully you'll find something uh, interesting throughout the session. We like to do this every sort of second month, and usually it's the last Thursday of the month in this time slot. It depends on uh, a few other things. We try to align it with the IMUC event that's run by uh, Ingram, and it's usually because their event follows on the back of ours, and we're usually in town together, and so, uh, yeah, two flies, one swatter, or however you want to say it. So... Uh, of course, our sponsors today, Lucidity, which is uh, the, uh, the crowd of Andrew, and uh, Jenny. Jenny's where I am at now, for those of you who uh, are following along. And uh, I'm sorry, somebody's just got a bit of background noise, if you don't mind just muting yourself. Otherwise, I will. If you can figure out who. <laughs> I, I know who it is. Uh, so. There we go. <laughs> I love that feature where you can now just go and mute all and all that kind of stuff. We'll get to that, eh? And then, so so Jenny, Jenny, new to New Zealand, um, but well-known in Australia. So uh, hopefully you'll hear more and more about them as you will with Lucidity moving forward. Just getting back to our sponsors today. Today, Jabra is our sponsor. And uh, Andrew, if you could just slide over to the next slide. Oh, Here we go, Microsoft nice. style. So this slide deck is actually with Andrew, and I've got another piece of here. On there we go. Right, so this is kind of what our agenda looks like. Um, Andrew's going to talk to us about virtual desktop versus Windows 365, which will be interesting because I know very little about those things. So hopefully uh, lots to learn. Um, I'm going to be digging into some of the updates since the last time we met, lots of new things happening, some of the stuff that's still coming, but it's, it's hard not to go too far. Otherwise, uh, there's uh, not much to talk about next time. And then, of course, we're going to have a, a Q&A session where we're happy to hear from you as well. Tell us about perhaps some of your successes, challenges, uh, perhaps something you're interested in us covering off next time around. We've also got a prize draw coming up. And usually there would be, instead of chit-chat, there'd be some pizza and beer. But instead, this is our prize today. This is the Jabra Evolve 265. Um, it's a stereo unit. It's got built-in busy light on the side over. You can see around the uh, the microphone over there. Very comfortable. Nice little headset. I did do a review of this headset a few months ago. And uh, for those of you who don't know, both Andrew and I like to make a noise about bits and pieces. My um, YouTube channel is called In My Humble Opinion. And you're welcome to go and have a look for that. Maybe afterwards we'll we'll drop some links into that. But this is the Jabra 2 Evolve 65, a really uh, solid headset. And you'll notice that uh, it says over there, um, passive noise cancellation. So 50% more than the Evolve 65. And I can attest to that. It's it's a lot better at drowning out the noise. It is an over-the-ear type. So it's, it, you know, it sits on your ears. And, of course, depending on, you know, what you prefer, that may or may not be uh, up your alley. 37 hours of battery. That's really good, eh? Right, so if you're interested in one of those, right at the end of our session, and don't drop off and come back later, we're watching. We'll uh, we'll have a little session there. We'll, we'll, we'll reveal later what we'll do to figure out who gets to take this puppy home or who gets to pick it up at the door when the courier delivers. Right, let's page on. All right, so there's lots of new faces here. So I've got the cheesy slide with my face on it, which kind of makes me cringe, but it, it's kind of useful to know what um, – who I am uh, and what I've done over the years. So I've got about 15 years working with Microsoft productivity tools. Um, but my key experience really is Skype for Business and Microsoft Teams and voice and meeting rooms and all that sort of stuff. But over the last um, nine months um, since joining Lucidity Cloud Services, I've been focus on, focusing on really the entire stack, um, productivity stack. Um, bit of security and um, Lucidity specialization over the last 20 years has been remote desktop technology. So that's really what we're known for and what we're good at. Um, and so that's been a really steep learning curve for me. So I thought what better way to learn uh, the modern remote desktop technology powered by Microsoft, but to have to present on it. So I've just learned all this stuff myself. Um, hopefully I've got it all correct. 
Um, but we'll try and make this a quite interactive session and feel free just to jump in if you've got questions because there's a lot, there's actually, I mean, there's a lot of information here trying to compare the two and it's a little bit death by PowerPoint. Um, I've tried to make it as easy to follow as possible, but um, if you want any clarifications, I will try and answer them as best I can. Um, and I'm also a Microsoft MVP, as is Paul. Um, uh, I've been awarded that award uh, eight, eight times running now, so it's something I'm quite proud of, and that's really just for doing things like this, doing things in the community um, outside uh, my day job uh, around the Microsoft technology stack. So um, without further ado, um, Azure Virtual Desktop versus off, uh, Windows 365, which is something uh, new to the table. Um, so again, thanks to our sponsors and a special thanks to Nerdio, who we use as our basically management and provisioning um, solution for Azure uh, Virtual Desktop. So I want to give them a special note here because they've provided me some stuff you'll see later on that gives um, some price comparisons in New Zealand dollars, um, comparing the Windows 365 to Azure Virtual Desktop. All right, so starting with what is the same. Um, so of course, it's a remote desktop uh, slash virtual desktop technology. Um, both are powered by Azure. Um, so they're running on the same stack. The difference being Windows 365 is in a Microsoft managed tenant, so not in your own tenant, so you don't have visibility of it. Um, they're powered by the same um, remote desktop clients and they're available on PC, Mac, iOS, Android, in the web browser. And hopefully if I've got time at the end, I'll give you a quick demo of what it all looks like. Um, and also I think Android as well, maybe that's in preview. I couldn't find it in the official documentation, but I'm sure I've read it somewhere. So, uh, sorry, did I say Android? Um, uh, Linux is what I meant. Um, the other thing is it supports uh, OneDrive files on demand, which is really good because this has been a problem over the last forever in remote desktop te technology because it was powered by uh, Windows Server. Um, and when you're doing shared desktops, that, that just didn't work very well. Um, and so that's fully supported now because we now have Windows 10 multi-session. You get the native Microsoft modern auth, so you can use the two-factor, um, you know, all of that stuff, conditional access, that's all just built into the product. And you can do audio, video, online meeting, optimization using VDI plugins. Um, and there are plugins for, I mean, we've, in my example tenant here, I've got Zoom, WebEx, and Microsoft, Microsoft Teams is actually baked into the Windows 10 OS. So there's a sort of a native, Plugin. So when you use Teams in AVD or Windows 365, it just hooks into that. Um, so that's really cool. The so next up, um, some of the differences. So when I compare these these two products, I'm going to be comparing the AVD stuff to the Windows 365 Enterprise, um, because probably most of you out there will be using the Enterprise product, not the business product, and you'll learn a little bit more about what the differences are in those two products after I've gone through the differences between what I'm calling the two enterprise grade products. So let's jump into it. So I've got really I'm, all of these comparisons are going to be table based comparisons. I couldn't think of a better way to show this. So this is why it's a little bit death by, by PowerPoint, but um, I'm just going to run through them, jump in if you want me to elaborate on anything if I don't do that um, to your satisfaction. So first off, as I just mentioned, uh, Windows 365 is actually hosted in a Microsoft managed Azure subscription, so you don't have visibility of that in your tenancy, uh, versus Azure is in your own tenancy, so you can see all your host pools, you can see your virtual machines, you can see all of that stuff, right? You don't get that with Windows 365. And there's a little bit of an architectural diagram there um, that Nerdio has provided, and you can see on this side here, this is the, the Microsoft um, tenancy, and with Windows 365 Enterprise, what they do is they sort of, they pipe uh, or inject the network into your own Azure tenancy. So you do have control over network within your own Azure tenancy, but everything else is inside Microsoft's tenancy. So you don't have any control of that um, and it's all managed by them basically. Windows 365 largely is fixed price compute. So you go and purchase this from um, the Microsoft 365 admin center. You can go and purchase that or via whatever means you purchase your licensing. Um, the only difference, uh, sorry, the only exception is the network access consumption, which is actually billed out of your Azure subscription. Um, for Windows 365 business, there is no additional cost, right? So it's, it's largely fixed price. Um, there's, not a there's not a lot of dollars in the network access stuff. 
Um, it's egress only that's charged, so not, not download, only upload. Um, so it's not massive, right? And I've got um, an example here. So 100, 100 gig using their calculator, using public internet is $15.80, right? So it's not, not ridiculous. Windows 365 Enterprise is managed by Intune uh, Endpoint Manager, and it's re it's a requirement, so you have to have it, so you have to be licensed for it, so it's an additional cost to be aware of. Um, and you right now you have to use AAD Hybrid Join, so that means basically you have on-prem AD. Azure AD Direct Join is coming soon, so that's in preview right now, um, but obviously it's not production ready. Um, and Azure Virtual Desktop, it's a lot easier to manage. Um, you could use Intune, although improvements are required. Um, Azure AD joins one of them because if you're going full native cloud, you kind of don't want on-prem AD ideally. Um, and we're largely pushing people that way, but there are some limitations there. Again, that, that will be resolved over time, and I think that also is in preview. Um, so you could use Intune, you could use your traditional gold images um, and something like Nerdio will help you manage those gold images. It does a lot of automations around your gold images and swaps them out and does all this sort of stuff. Um, you could manually manage them because you've got access to the VMs. Um, and there's this MISX app attach for managing applications, which um, I don't know how hundred, a, a lot about, to be honest, but that allows you to, ma uh, to manage some apps uh, on those images without managing the images directly. Um, so... Windows 365, no access to the VM resources, as I've mentioned, right? Um, versus Azure Virtual Desktop, you have full access. So you will see your host pools, as I said, you'll see your VMs, you'll see your network connections, you'll see all of that stuff inside your um, Azure tenancy, basically. So something to be aware of. Um, Windows 365 is 100% dedicated personal desktops, right? So all of the user's data is stored on that device um, versus... Azure Virtual Desktop, you can do dedicated and shared desktops, and you can then obviously use some different methodologies to manage your file system. So you could use Azure Files. Um, they use, um, someone on the call might be able to help me out here, uh, FX Logics to kind of manage drives, uh, which is kind of, it contains user profiles and VHDX files. Um, so it's a bit more scalable from that perspective. Um, and shared desktops, support this Windows 10 multi-session. So you're no longer trying to make a um, Windows Server OS kind of look nice and sexy for the users. You just get Windows 10 multi-session and it looks exactly like what everyone's used to when they're um, running a um, laptop or a workstation. Windows 365's kind of got a prescribed CPU RAM disk combo and there's 12 sizes today. Um, so you can go from one VPC CPU to eight, two gigs of RAM to 32, 64 gigs to 512 storage. Uh, whereas AVD, you're flexible within the bounds of, of what Azure VMs can do basically, and you've got access to premium SSD, which is um, certainly something you'd probably want. Well, I think it's something you would want if you're doing multi-session. Um, it just, it's just so much faster. Um, so Windows 365 is Windows 10 enterprise only, single session. In Azure Virtual Desktop, we've actually got Windows 7 extended support in there. So security updates are provided by Microsoft to Windows 7. Kind of, uh, they are actually available, but you have to go on extended support. So you've got to pay for that to get Windows 7 updates. So if you've actually got applications that can't get off Windows 7, which a lot of people do, and that's holding people up, uh, moving into the cloud, Microsoft's actually supporting Windows 7 as a VM option um, with free security updates, basically, so you don't have to pay an extra. you got Windows 10 Enterprise single session, multi session, and you've obviously got all the supported server versions that you can run in there as well if you want to do it that way. VM images Microsoft has a built in catalog that Windows 365 can access, and you can also upload your own custom images. Um, up to 20 of them. Um, that's not something I've actually tested myself. I don't know exactly how you manage them. I guess you have to manage those images outside of the bounds of W365 um, and upload them basically versus Azure Virtual Desktop is a little bit more manageable because you can see those resources and you can interact with them. You can spin them up. You can do all that sort of stuff. Um, so same applies there. Built-in images, but any number of custom images as well. 
there's no native backup solution, but obviously you could install some third-party agent-based backup on each of the user's desktops. Um, in AVD, you can use Azure Backup or a third-party backup option, which would you've, you've got access to the network as well, so there might be some options there around backing up because you've got, in, in both examples actually, um, you've got some access to the network, right? So you could back up, um, and I'm sure these third-party backup vendors will be inventing products as we speak. There's a little bit of self-service in Windows 365. Um, you can't do a hell of a lot, but you can reboot your machine or reset it to factory default defaults. So kind of useful, the user can do that themselves. Uh, AVD, there is no self-service unless you've got something like Nerdio um, that gives you a self-service portal for the users. And is that dropping off the page for you guys? It is for me for some reason. Um, for Office app subscriptions, so in Windows 365, you can use any kind of app subscription, uh, Office app subscription. But for Azure Virtual Desktop, you just got to bear in mind you need the shared computer activation version, which is not only available in Enterprise. So if you have ops, uh, app, Office apps for Enterprise, you're covered. Business Premium, which has Office apps for business, actually still has that license capability as well. So either of those two um, will work. And I think E5 and probably E3 and various other combinations have that as well. So most people will already be licensed for that, but just something to be aware of. So now just having a look at business um, versus enterprise, just so you know the differences there. And I think you'll probably, most of you will agree, unless you're a pretty small business, you probably won't go um, business. But business is super easy. I can literally in you know five minutes go and procure a license, assign it to a user, and within an hour my desktop's up and up and running and the user gets an email saying you can now log into to your desktop. So literally no experience required. You don't need to really know how to manage it. It's it's kind of like just having a laptop, right? But it's in a virtual environment. You turn it on, you log in, and you're done. For AVD, you obviously need a bit of, oh, sorry, for, oh, I've got the wrong thing up here. That should be, dang, bit of a typo there. So on the left is business, on the right is enterprise. So apologies for that. So um, enterprise, you need a bit of experience, in particular in tune. Um, you need to have an Azure tenancy. Um, you know, you need you need an IT team or someone that can look after this for you. Um, so there's no subscription required in Windows 365 Business, so you don't even have an Azure tenancy, whereas um, for, for Enterprise you do. Um, it's Azure AD uh, only um, for Windows 365 Business versus AVD, you've got, you can use your own on-prem style Windows AD um, and you, you'll be able to use um, Azure AD join um, very soon, it's in preview as I mentioned. You've only got internet access in um, business, so you just get Microsoft internet access basically. And um, in enterprise, as I showed you in that diagram, you've, your network access is injected into your um, Azure tenancy, right? So you've got a bit of manageability of that. You will get billed for egress traffic, um, but you could do things like VPNs to your site um, or you know various other things that you may already be doing in Azure uh, will be supported by um, the business equivalent. There's no static IP option available yet in business. Um, for enterprise, there is because you have network control in your Azure tenancy. So there's absolutely zero transfer costs for business versus egress costs for uh, enterprise. There's no native uh, management solution for Windows 365 business. So obviously you could probably bring a third party thing to the to the table, like an RMM or something like that running on the desktops uh, versus enterprise, which requires Intune. So you, you have to have Intune uh, whether you like it or not uh, and whether you're using it or not to, to manage the device day to day. No custom images for business. It is what it is. Windows 10, that's what you get. Um, enterprise, you have the built-in and the 20 custom images, as I've mentioned before. For business, your printers are accessed purely through RDP redirection, so on the local network. For enterprise, because you have access to the network, you also have the ability to um, you know, VP into a site, for example, from Azure and give people access to network printers. Oh, that's the end of that. So I just pause here quickly, now that I've done the comparisons, is there any questions so far? I'll leave, go back to that one.
Cool. So just on to licensing. So this is non-compute licensing. So this is not your Azure stuff, not your Windows 365 subscription. Um, so, so Windows 365 needs um, a per user subscription um, and no OS specific license is required. So you basically just procure that license um, Non-compute licensing is not quite right here, really, because the Windows 365 license kind of gives you the compute. But anyway, um, so you need that you need that user license, and that's it, right? You buy that license, you've got a virtual machine that for the for the individual user that you bought the license for. No Windows OS um, licensing required. But for in enterprise, you need the same, but you also need the user to be licensed for Windows 10 Enterprise. And there's various ways to do that. And if you're not aware, Windows 10 Enterprise is actually a subscription license. And what it requires is that the user's primary device is already Windows 10 Pro. Uh, I think the other uh, older versions of Windows, as long as they're Pro, qualify for this as well. Um, but you have to have, let's just call it Windows 10 Pro running on your primary device, the user does, right? And then you need to add on a Windows 10 Enterprise per user subscription. There are other ways to license this. Um, and if you go to my blog, I've got a whole ton of articles on all of this sort of stuff and I'll refer, refer, um, refer you to that later. But you have to have that license. Um, so as an example, Microsoft 365 F3, E3, E5 include it. Business Premium includes it. Enterprise Mobility E3, E5 includes it. Um, if you bundle that with the Windows 10 Enterprise E3, E5. So you can do it that way if you're just doing interning of devices. Um, so yeah, there's various ways you can license it, but that's an additional license. You need Windows Endpoint Manager slash Intune, right? So it's another license you need. Uh, and you need Azure Active Directory P1. And I think all of those licenses I just mentioned, those bundles include all of those things you need. So it may be that you already have all this stuff right now, but if you don't, there's obviously going to be quite a bit of uplift in per user per month spending to do Windows 365 Enterprise. For AVD, um, there's no per user license requirement. It's fully consumption based, right? So you're, you're getting charged on usage inside Azure. Um, and same applies for, for the Windows 10 Enterprise license, right? You, you need that, win, that license. Um, and you're not bound to Windows Endpoint Manager or Azure Active Directory either for that um, particular um, way of doing it, AVD. Uh, just some thoughts on when you'd maybe choose what. So I think Windows 365 business is really suitable for really small businesses um, where it just needs to be easy and they just want a desktop in the cloud um, and you don't really need to know, know too much about it. You don't need any desktop virtualization, virtualization experience. Um, you really don't even have to manage it if you don't want to. You don't need any kind of centralized management solution. Um, you want 24-7 access to desktops, just like you would a laptop. This is another good example because this is a personal desktop that's always available and always running. Uh, it's another consideration. And you'll see a little bit of that, more about this soon when I start talking about the costing. Um, and yeah, local admin rights is another one as well, which is harder to do on a shared desktop, uh, if not impossible. Um, and you have no current or planned Azure, Azure footprint. So that's some good use cases that you'd maybe pick business. Enterprise would be suitable for small to large. Um, a small business might want the manageability um, and control and security and all that sort of stuff, right? So, but this will scale up to large businesses. Um, you don't really need any virtualization experience because the, the VMs are all managed by Microsoft. You do probably want some experience with Intune because that's going to be managing it and it's a requirement of the solution. Again, if you want 24-7 persistent desktops, uh, this one's for you. Um, and again, local admin rights, etc. So for AVD, I would say medium to large. It just it doesn't really scale down to small just because there's certain costs that you're going to pay for from a consumption basis right off the bat. As you, as you scale it and have more and more users, it becomes vastly cheaper. Uh, you'll see that soon. So you would need some desktop virtualized experience, uh, virtualization experience. You would probably want um, experience managing desktops, images, um, you know, 
man management solutions for apps and all this sort of stuff, whether you're doing that in gold images or whether you're using Intune or third party RMM, you'd probably want some experience there. 24-7 um, access is not required. I say that because that's where you get the cost benefits. If you're not doing, if you're not using sort of auto scaling and cost savings that way, then maybe Windows 365 is maybe a better solution there. Um, shared desktops is a requirement of that same for that same reason. Um, pooling re resources costs you, uh, saves you a lot of money. And another really good use case is um, high fluctuations and users, people coming and going, seasonal workers, that sort of thing. So again, another nice graphic from Nerdio. I won't go over it because I've essentially kind of covered all of these points, but <clears throat> this is just a nice visual way of looking at what to choose. Um, and if you just go and um, Google Windows 365 versus Azure Virtual Desktop, you'll they'll probably come up top of the list. Um, and you can go and read a whole mu lot more information about. Um, they've written some really really good articles actually on on this on this topic. Okay, so in terms of costs, right? So this is all Nerdio graphics here, um, and in New Zealand dollars. So these are, these are estimates, right? And they have some assumptions, and you can see the assumptions down the bottom here. And as I go through these, I won't I won't go over them. I'm just going to high level cover the key point um, of the slide. Um, but I'll, we will share these slides. And again, you can go and look at the Nerdio website. It won't be in New Zealand dollars, but um, you'll have the slide deck to help you compare as well. So. In summary, Windows 365 is probably going to be more cost effective where you need dedicated personal desktops um, and you've got people using them over 50 hours a week, right? Um, you start losing uh, over 50 hours, you kind of start losing some of the cost savings you'd get in the auto scaling. Um, and AVD is more cost effective when um, users can be pulled um, and you can realize the significant cost savings that you get from auto scaling. So just taking through some examples, right? So, so, so this is an example of a personal desktop where it's always on. So in that case, W365 is going to be cheaper. Um, you also get the comfort of fixed price and there's no term necessarily required. Uh, the personal desktop running 10 hours a day, five days a week, AVD is cheaper, and that's simply because of the auto scaling and not running 24 seven. So, what we're, what we're doing there effectively is we're turning VMs on and off. We might have a always on VM. Um, and as we hit the 10th user, we'll turn another one on and another one on and another one on. And as people leave for the day, we'll turn them off, 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 off. Um, and that just happens in the background on its own. And in, in that case, you see the average savings is about 30%. <clears throat> for shared desktops that are always on, um, AVD considerably cheaper. Um, and that's because you're also you're taking advantage of auto scaling, but you're also taking advantage of multiple users on a desktop. Um, and the other thing with always on is you would leverage uh, the sort of three year pricing term because that'll half the cost of each VM if you if you were running always on VMs. So you'd probably you'd want to subscribe to the probably the three years I would imagine uh, because that will roughly half your costs. For shared desktops running 10 hours, five days a week, again, AVD considerably cheaper, cheaper again, 72% cheaper, because in this case, we're taking advantage of the auto scaling um, and we're not running 24 seven, so we're ramping VMs up and down um, and we've got multiple users on the desktops. Oh my gosh, I went faster than I thought. So now, because I've got time, I'll quickly just show you around what it looks like. I mean, it just looks like a desktop, but I'll just show you some of the some of the tools and things like that. Um, if you want some more info, I've written quite a few blogs on this recently, uh, just to help myself get my head around it. Um, and pretty much everything I've discussed is in my on my blog in a hell of a lot more detail. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just quickly switch from content to desktop. Just give me a sec. So hopefully you're seeing my desktop there. Um, now, let's take you through. So this is this is Windows 365. So this is what you'll get um, as a user when um, Windows 365 is provisioned for you. So this is sort of the self-service portal, right? And you can go and open directly in a browser. I can restart my machine. I can reset my machine. Um, I can go and download the desktop clients or, or get referred to get the mobile clients. So this is kind of what the user will see. From a turning it on perspective, 
you literally, I mean, I've just got a standalone subscription with a credit card in it, right? But I could, I could just go purchase services. Um, and this is kind of all you have to do, really. If you've got a credit card loaded, you would just go Windows 365, I want Windows 365 Business or Windows 365 uh, Enterprise, throw it down here. Um, I didn't cover hybrid benefit, but hybrid benefits kind of when you're already invested. If you, if you want, I think it, it's if you're running already running Windows 10 Pro on the desktop, they kind of give you a discount, so you're not paying kind of twice for your licenses. So if you've got Windows 10 Pro on the desktop, um, you, you go with hybrid benefit. Um, doesn't apply for Windows 10 Enterprise because Enterprise requires that you have that per user per month Windows 10 Enterprise uplift for the user. But if you go in business, it does apply. So if you if you're a Windows if you're a Windows Home Windows 10 Home user, you'd need this. If you're a Windows 10 Pro user, you could take that and take the discount. So I can go in here, buy this thing. Then I literally go to users uh, and I'll go to the my user who is licensed. This guy here and You'll see here that I've got that available, right? So I just go and tick that, and that automatically provisions it. It usually takes about an hour to get the VM spun up and running, and then the end user will get an email telling them they've now got access to the VM, and they they just use their corporate credentials or their Office 365 credentials that they subscribed with, um, and that's it. That's that's done. That's all you have to do. Versus enterprise, once you've done this part. You've still got to hook yourself up to Intune, and there's various other steps that you've got to run through. Um, and then you get the portal, and you can click open in browser, and you get this here. So this is me running in a browser. I could download the app as well. So this is the app. I've got multiple different desktops that I'm running. Um, that's quick access into your virtual desktop if you don't want to use browser. So that's kind of what Windows 365 looks like. Nothing too exciting. It's just a desktop, but um, there you go. Then over this side here, I've got, um, this is Enterprise, uh, sorry, AVD. So same thing, um, but here you can see I've got the WebEx client running, and actually I can't show you my system tray, but if I was to start a, call, a WebEx call or a Zoom call, because I've got the VDI plugin on my desktop, it will show that it's connected to, to the AVD session, um, and that will allow basically the audio and video to be handled on my PC versus inside the remote desktop. So that gives you a vastly better experience. Uh, and kind of just to show off quickly, I'll, I can actually join this meeting right within AVD, and I'm probably going to get some feedback, and I didn't have time to figure out why that was, even though I'm muted and my speaker's muted, but probably because I'm on the same system with the same audio devices, something funky's happening. But anyway, I'll join the meeting just to show you so you can do it. I don't know if you're hearing that feedback, but I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it. But there you go. That's that's me in, inside AVD. Uh, I don't know what the quality is like for you guys on your end, but it's um, video inside video inside video. But it works pretty good in practice. It actually tends to um, take a little bit of time just to get the quality up. But um, did you guys see the quality reasonable, or is it, is, is it has it caught up? Still a bit fairy, Andrew. A little bit fairy. Right. Well, it doesn't normally say fairy this long, but it, it could be something to do with my scenario that I've, I'm in a video call and I'm yeah, I've, I've got all sorts going on here. So anyway, I'll kill that jump out and go back to where I was. Right, am I here still, hopefully? Didn't click the wrong one. So yeah, that, that's kind of me. Um, I'll let Paul sort of load up his deck, but if you've got any questions, fire them at me while he's doing that. Stunned silence. Very good. That's it. Right. Let me get myself aligned over here. Okay. And I'll do the uh, the usual required. Can you see my share? Yes. Thumbs up. Smile. No. How's that, Andrew? All good. Yep. Beautiful. Excellent. 
Okay. Uh, well, uh, there's so, been so many. Yep. Somebody about to interrupt me there. Right. Okay. All good. There's been so many changes and so many new things come out. Like Microsoft's in overdrive. It looks like when they go into lockdown, they tend to have nothing else to do than to develop new features. Uh, and so it, it always surprises me at, as to the pace at which they do this. And I might just uh, stop spotlighting Andrew so that, uh, there you go. How about that, Andrew? That sounds better, eh? I'll just spotlight myself. There you go. Right. Okay. Back as we were. And so, so they do have a little bit of fun as well. As you can see over here, they've started out this, this idea of nostalgic backgrounds. And if you've been around long enough, you does anyone know, just by the way, does anyone know how old Clippy is? Any guesses? Yeah, no. 30. 30. <clears throat> He's ex this year. He's 32 years old. Years old. Wow. There wow. we go. Yeah, it's crazy, eh? Unbelievable. August, so, I think it was. What was that? August thrill. I think it was. Yeah, something like that. It's it's crazy because it's been around so long, uh, and it's. I, I tell you honestly, um, I do miss Clippy. You know, it was annoying at the time, but now looking back, isn't that life, eh? Uh, and of course, so these are high definition backgrounds. You can get them. All you have to do is go and search for nostalgic backgrounds, Microsoft Teams, and Microsoft's released these now, which yeah, a little bit of fun, hey? Uh, just to sort of start things slowly. Now, um, I've got quite a few little bits and pieces. Some of them are well known, some of them not uh, in terms of new stuff. Now, this is in looking at the meeting space. This was already released, and you can lock the meeting now. You may have heard in our previous sessions that often I'll talk about things that you kind of saw in Zoom and now they've come to Teams. That's still true. So locking a meeting was a feature you, you still have in Zoom today where you can start up a meeting, it can be open, but once all the people have started, have joined, you can lock a meeting, no one else can join. That's what you can do here in Teams now as well. So that's released. Um, it's on desktop only in terms of the meeting um, host but that'll probably change in the near future as all things do change. Uh, another thing that, that was um, put out quite quickly was recording meetings automatically. Now, I'll point out that I haven't seen this functionality when it comes to the likes of Zoom, but basically what it means is you get to set from the get-go before you, so when you're scheduling the meeting, you can actually set it to, to record. And then the, this screenshot you're seeing here is actually uh, in the meeting options within Outlook. So when you're scheduling the meeting, you can already set it to record. That's really cool. If you think about how many times you've been, perhaps even in a recurring meeting, and you're supposed to be recording it, uh, then, you know, you, you always kind of, oh, supposed to record that, you missed the first bit. David, if you don't share that T-shirt with us, there's going to be a problem. So um, that's that's recorded automatically, which is quite handy. It does mean that the first person who joins from your organization, that's what kicks it off. So it's not a case of other people joining and it's recording them just randomly. And then what happens is it pops up with the usual recording um, window over there, the, the little banner that says you're being recorded. So it's still compliant and all that kind of stuff. This one over here was interesting. Uh, we've now got the seven by seven. Just remember, just the other day, we were still kind of going, hey, we're going to get three by three video. Who remembers that? And then it was, oh, we're going five by five. And now look where we're at. We're at, you know, seven by seven. So this is very similar to what you can do in Zoom today. And you can page. So you see down the bottom there, we've got that little one of two. In Zoom, you've got exactly the same. You can page two, three that sort of stuff. It'll only show you the seven by seven on the screen. Um, again, just thinking out loud about Zoom and Teams. What I like about Teams over Zoom in this particular space is Teams will dynamically use the real estate and perhaps somebody's video will be a bit bigger than somebody else's, but it won't waste the real estate with black space. Whereas Zoom just kind of same size image for everyone and that's just the way it is. So um, interesting to see that popping through. Organization-wide backgrounds. I've seen this uh, being something that's been requested quite a while now. We've gone a little crazy with backgrounds, haven't we? Um, 
in some organizations, they kind of frown upon it. They don't want you to turn off that freedom, but they do want to curtail the range of images you can add in there. And so uh, this is coming very, very soon where you can add up to 50 images, oops, uh, up to 50 images from, say, a corporate library. You'll see them loaded over there, and those are the ones you can choose from. So they're still giving their users a fair bit of flexibility, but it's only those, and you can't, uh, you can't go beyond that. And that's administrative-driven. Um, so um, just a little watch out for that one. It requires this advanced communications license. That's the license that adds another, what was it, Andrew? Can you remember? It's like something like 10 US dollars on top of oh, what you today. Yeah. You don't get much for it, and it's like 12 bucks or something. That's Probably. it. That's it. And there's, yeah, yeah. And then I think there was something about call recording you'd get in there and all that kind of stuff. But it is where it is. Um, so, you know, uh, we'll, um, we'll see how that goes moving forward. At the moment, it's temporarily available. It's kind of part of the, the preview program, right? Spotlight. Now, I mean, obviously, I've got Spotlight set to myself now. You can have, you can see in this image here, you can have multiple people spotlighted up to seven. That's pretty cool. In Teams, um, you can spotlight uh, um, up to seven. In Zoom, it's two. So it only recently added the second, which is nice. So you basically, that means they're the focus, they're the two people that are in focus or the seven people in our case. And what's nice is if you're watching this presentation now, you've got me spotlight as on the side. It's fixed now, by the way. It used to be broken that if you spotlight somebody while there was content, you couldn't see the content. <laughs> they fixed that, yay, um, quietly. Didn't say much about it, but it's fixed. And if you spotlight multiple people, they'll show up there with your, with your content still in view. So that's quite handy. Uh, of course, if you went and clicked on more actions and you went and did a, I think it's called focus, then what happens is you'll only see the content and the focus the, or the spotlight persons. That's to avoid distractions of, you know, somebody uh, making a bit of distracting movements and, you know, the cat and all that kind of stuff. So quite handy to focus, hence why it's called. So that's not new. It's been there all along. Uh, can't spotlight on the um, Surface Hub yet. The Surface Hub is quickly becoming the uh, the least feature option these days. We'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Chat bubbles. When this came out, I was trying to work out what is the use case. But then, of course, when I came across the original image, it was pretty, pretty obvious. So chat bubbles means that if anybody's chatting, like if you think of it today, if I chat within a meeting, unless you go click on the chat button at the top, you don't actually see the chat, and then you won't be able to tell that there are messages in the chat. But with chat bubbles turned on, as soon as there's a chat, it just pops up in the center of the screen over there and tells you the little chat. But I've, I've chucked a red bar around it just so it's nice and clear. So chat bubbles, that's what they're all about. They snuck in secretly over there, which is quite interesting. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, of course, call health. Now, again, from a troubleshooting perspective, somebody's complaining, yeah, I'm getting poor quality and dropping out, all these kinds of things. This is a end user call health. So you go into your ellipses, you hit call health, you get this bar over here, and then you can go and have a look at what the latency was, what the uh, sort of drop packets, all this kind of stuff, which is quite handy. So you can tell the codecs that are being used and, and all that kind of stuff. I have found that it's it still has a few gaps, like you might be doing some presentation and it won't quite pick that up straight away. Um, it does refresh, if you look on the top over there, every 15 seconds. So um, it does give users kind of a, roughly speaking, I guess you could say a bit of a dashboard of what's going on on their local side in terms of that. So... You know, we're getting smarter users, I guess, and a lot of people are working from home these days out of, you know, what, what do you do, right? And so perhaps it is a good way to go. No, actually, uh, end user, it is your Wi-Fi that's not working well. So maybe you do need to, to turn things down a bit. What do you do, by the way? What do you do if you're on a video call like this and you really want to see the content, but it's really choppy and it's not working well? Your network's obviously Doing things around a little bit. What do you do? Does anyone know? 
What, so what's the, the easiest way to sort that? Well, again, on the ellipses, you just click on the ellipses and there is a turn off incoming video option, which you want to make use of. And what that does is it just drops all that video down. There we go. Thanks, Keith. You'll be able to lock down soon. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I did see a question in the chat about recordings. So here we go. What's happening to the recording? So this has been rolling out since uh, the last sort of week or two. All meeting recordings now go to OneDrive. This is OneDrive for business, right? So not that little private OneDrive you get with your PC install. This is um, where it's at. And so that means, you know, that policy where we used to set the meeting recordings to go not stream but to OneDrive? That's going to get ignored as soon as this is fully rolled out. And then that's the end of it. Um, the reasoning behind that, well, in the past, all our meeting recordings ended up in stream. The problem with stream, it's really hard to share. Well, you, you can only really share with people inside your organization because they have to authenticate to stream. So we had to download it and then take that and ship that off to OneDrive somewhere, which, again, was a challenge. So this is just nice and easy, and you can just go and share it from there, and it just makes life so much easier. So... Nice little change. Um, I think most of you have probably played with it already. Breakout rooms. I'm a fan of breakout rooms. Um, I did a session on breakout rooms earlier this year just to kind of uh, showcase the power of breakout rooms. Now, one of the big challenges I've always had with breakout rooms is that even in Zoom, you couldn't pre-configure them or pre-create them. I couldn't pre-stage them, I guess. So I couldn't go and say, hey, I want to take – the people that are coming in and I want to assign these folks to that room and these folks to that room before we even start the meeting. Imagine, so breakout rooms, I guess you've got to think about what the use case is. Where do you really see them being used in the industry? And one of the primary areas I see is sort of in, in education. So think of, um, I don't know, school, high school, uni, where you're having a uh, a lecture or a session, and then the lecturer teacher comes a along and says, right, okay, we're not going to break out into four different groups, and each group's going to carry on and run this project, and here's the tasks I want you to complete, and they can go off, and then the teacher can come around and wow. bounce into each room and just check in on how they're doing and that sort of stuff. The problem was is configuring the breakout rooms was something you had to kind of do on the fly whilst everyone was in the primary room. So you had to kind of configure it when everybody was joined, and that can take some time. It doesn't take a lot of time if you do it a lot, but if you had the, the more rooms and the more assignments, the more people you had to break out into rooms, it could be potentially something that slows you down. But if you already knew pre, you could pre-create them. This is coming in the, the third quarter where you can pre-create them, you can assign the participants, assign their tasks in advance. And it doesn't matter, you know how you assign the participants, it could be manual or auto, it doesn't matter. When you do pre-created breakout rooms, it just works the same way, regardless. You know, you, you just choose those and off you go. This little feature I've been trying to get my hands on, uh, it just hasn't showed up in my tenant just yet. I'm very keen to see this. This is basically um, from your team's mobile app. There is an application called Rooms Remote, right? It'll be out officially the third quarter, so... Um, it sends some sort of preview, which I haven't been able to get on yet. Have you seen it, Andrew? No. No. Okay, so what it basically means is you pick up your mobile, you're in a room, Android, right? This is specifically for Android, and you're in an MTR, uh, so uh, meeting with Android, you pick up your phone, you go room control, you tell it which room, and there you go. You've got control of the room from your mobile device. That's video on, video off, mute on, mute off, volume up, volume down. There is captions in there as well. Um, all the MTR units don't do captions just yet, but you can see where this is going. I'm expecting to see some more functionality added to there. And you might wonder, what's the use case? What's the use case? So I know very often we have MTR with a control panel, so the little, um, you know, seven inch, eight inch, 10 inch, depending on what device you have, that is your control panel for the room. But because MTR can be without that, especially the Android, MTR on Android, this could be a handy way to manage those uh, sorts of environments. Interesting, um, as soon as I can get it enabled in my tenant, I'll be having a play. 
There are other new features on the MTR space. Now, firstly, I just want to point out that in the meeting room space, Microsoft essentially has three products, right? They've got obviously Surface Hub, which has its space. They've got MTR on Android and MTR on Windows. Now today, MTR on Windows has the richest feature set for now. That'll change in the future because um, we can already see the MTR on Android accelerating forward, like the previous feature I've just mentioned, which is that control from the mobile device. So some of the things that are new to MTR on Android is this HDMI ingest. We've been waiting for that for ages, the ability to share content on an Android-driven MTR system. Now it's out. That's great. Auto accept meet now. That's so if you run a meet now meeting, if you don't have auto accept, then you, you'd have to go to the meeting room and go and click join. This is across uh, Android and Windows. So that's a new feature uh, for both. And again, coming to Android 1080p video, that's new. I don't know if you realize that, but MTR on Android never did 1080p. That was only available on the Windows-based um, MTRs. Now it's also running on Android. Again, I just want to point out it's absolutely dependent on the bandwidth you have. And some of the devices so far um, are still a little bit behind some of the vendors. They're just catching up. So very, very early days. And that's why we're seeing Q3 down the bottom here, right? Live captioning, lock the meeting, hide meeting names and calendar, all those are, you know, live captioning is out on some of the devices, not on all. So like I said, it's Q3 for the lot of them, right? Been able to lock meetings. So these things are available on desktop, but this is MTR we're talking about. So very soon we'll see those surface. So you can see the meeting space accelerating, eh? leaping ahead from uh, strength to strength. This is another area that popped up. I don't know. I think it's probably maybe 18 months ago, um, and maybe even longer. I don't know. I'm losing track of time. But the Teams panels. Um, for, for the room. So these are the panels that sit on the outside of the room, usually just on the door there somewhere on the, the side of the room wall. And you can go there and you can go and see if the room's busy. You'll see this particular one is the Crestron unit. And you can see it's actually lit up green on the side to show the rooms available. So there's actually LED strips. There are a whole bunch of different vendors doing stuff in this space. But Microsoft have now officially got a, um, a range of these that are certified. So for instance, Yaelink have one as well. Crestron have one. Um, yes, I know you can get, get Joan and those sorts of products. Slightly different use case, but these are the ones that the Microsoft have been, um, they've been backing these. So that's just a bit of a breakdown of what they look like. And if you, I don't know if you can see in there, but it's like nearby rooms. So if you clicked on nearby rooms, you might come up with this little screenshot that shows you a map layout. And that nearby rooms, if you went into Microsoft Teams and you looked for an app called Teams Rooms, you'll actually see it's an app and you can upload your maps. So what it actually is, is app surfacing of line of business apps within the panel. So in this case, we've got catering, concierge service, maybe a shuttle service. It starts to become quite configurable and it starts to become quite personal to, to your organization, how you want to use that. That's pretty cool. And again, this hide meeting name. So imagine you've got a meeting in here. That one says product review. But what if it said something a little bit more um, confidential? So we do have the ability to hide meeting names on the panel on the outside of the room because, you know, obviously you don't just want that to be popping up for everyone to see. What else do we have? Oh, this is a little feature that I was like, oh, I didn't even see that coming through. This is calling now. Um, it, it's just been out. We've got by early July. I've seen it roll out already. So in the past, you were able to transfer a call from desktop to mobile, mobile to desktop. And there was mostly meetings, but now it's extended to calls as well. So if you're in a call and you're about to hit the road and you want to carry on the call as you drive to, just let's imagine you're not in lockdown and you're allowed to go somewhere, right? Then that would be pretty handy, wouldn't it? So you, you can just switch over the call and Microsoft's terminology is uh, no interruption in call service or quality. 
Uh, it's exactly the same as the meeting experience. You're basically joining it and, you, and it asks you, I don't know if you saw that, do you want to add this device or do you want to transfer? Now, it, it's brilliant. I, I love how you can just transfer a call over there. You know, it just makes life so much easier. Long overdue. I mean, this is a standard PAVX feature from years gone by. So um, I'm surprised it's taken that long. Operator Connect, ah, the new way to connect voice into your team's backend. Now, um, Operator Connect's in preview at the moment. And although at, was it at Ignite, uh, Microsoft announced there were something like 24, 26 vendors or telcos globally that were gonna make Operator Connect um, appearances the reality is in our part of the world, that's the four you can get to. Now I went through a little, a little exercise where I contacted each of those four in an attempt to get a trial set up. Um, only one of them has responded to date. Uh, yes, it's not that easy, is it? That's what I found too. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm talking about, you know, we're talking about a two month period here and, and, and only one of them's responded. And um, it, it, it's a little bit annoying, what does it actually mean? What is this Operator Connect all about? Well, basically, in the big scheme of the world, you can get teams calling or the ability to call PSTN numbers uh, from different aspects. You can get it straight from Microsoft. So you can just buy calling off Microsoft, you buy minute bundles, you pay for that calling license, and you get to go, right? Well, sort of. Uh, they have, they, theirs comes at a premium. Um, Moving forward, Microsoft intend to become more competitive in that space. You can go direct routing, direct routing, and, and perhaps we'll do a session. I know, Andrew, you did a really nice blog um, write-up on all of this. You can go direct route. Direct routing, there's two flavors of. There's the telco-hosted direct routing, which basically means you buy it off Spark or Vodafone or uh, Cordia or one of those guys, and they just go, here's the, the, the details, and they'll hook you up. The problem with doing it that way is it's a bit of a mixed bag as to how you manage it. Moving numbers is in PowerShell. Um, you kind of manage the numbers. They kind of do some bits on their end. And it, it's not just clear cut. There's kind of two parts to it, right? Which makes it a little bit difficult if you're not that technical, especially to manage numbers using PowerShell, for example. Whereas if you use the Teams, uh, Microsoft flavor, all the numbers just show up magically in the portal and you can see all the numbers and it's all pretty pretty gooey driven, right? And then of course, there's the other flavor that I guess we've spent a lot of time on over the last few years, Andrew and myself have, which is direct routing, but it's when you're hosting your own SPC. So you have a direct route connection from your SPC to the cloud, but that's the most flexible. It's not vanilla. That's when you're hanging all sorts of weird stuff off your local SPC, maybe a PAPX, maybe an on-prem, I don't know, elevator phone, who knows, whatever it is, interconnectivity to elsewhere, all that kind of stuff is what you get. So it's the most flexible, but it's also the most complex in terms of setting it up, and you need some special skills for that. So where does Operator Connect fit in? So Operator Connect is kind of between the direct routing as a service and the Microsoft offering. It, it does hybrid of those. It's a direct routing as a service, but all the numbers will surface in the Microsoft Cloud Admin Center. So it's kind of like Microsoft have gone, hey, let's pull some more telcos into this because probably they know more than we do about calling. So maybe we'll just let them surface their product. Um, so it's a bit more visibility, a bit more sort of GUI driven, less technical requirements to get it up and running. It's not available yet. Um, Pure IP reckon they're they're ready to go with it today, but it's it's not quite released. It's still in preview, so they're close. I actually have a, a mate at Pure IP who's quite keen to talk to us about exactly what their offer is and how it's positioned uh, compared to everything else that's available. What I have been told is you would think that would be a premium, right? It'd be because it's less complex, so it's a lot easier. The, the guys at Pure IP are telling me that they're going to offer the calling and the connectivity at exactly the same rate as their direct routing product you can buy through Cordia today. Which, okay, that's cool. Because it's a lot less technical involvement 
to get the same outcome, single portal to manage in. So, okay, that'll be interesting. Um, I must point out though, that it's basic, basic calling. So inbound and outbound calling only. If you want call queues, IVRs, that kind of stuff, you're out of luck. If you want extension dialing, no can do. Really? So, it doesn't support the, the queues? I didn't know that. No, not yet. Oh. <laughs> So that's then that's going to be version two. What's, what's the point? You might as <laughs> I well. Know. I know, I know, I know. So that'll be interesting. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Perhaps our next uh, meetup. I'll see if I can get them to talk to that, eh? And they can give us an update where they're at. There's another interesting little feature. One of the things you can do is um, just use the the numbers built into Microsoft for the direct uh, for the auto attendance and such. Sure. Yeah. That's the the only kind of get around. You can't bring your own numbers, but at least there are numbers you could assign. Yeah, yeah, and you know, just change all your letterhead. No, that's what toll fee numbers are for. Eh? You just pin your toll fee numbers to those, and you're often good to go. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Um, We've been able to pin all sorts. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to pin, say I've got a, um, a team where I've got all my doc, maybe it's a customer's uh, team, and I've got all my customers with folders and all the rest of it, and I'm working on customer, and the customer is, I don't know, Z Energy, for example. I use them as an example because of the letter Z, right? One <laughs> thing I hate about teams is scrolling, trying to find the right, it's just so painful um, to do that. Now, of course, you can switch the search order and get there a little bit quicker. But when you've got hundreds and hundreds of customers in there, the easiest way to do it is I usually go and right click and pin the folder. So what it'll do is it'll put the folder right on top within the files section over there. This is exactly the same thing, but pinning a chat. So maybe there's a chat that was a, hey, here's the assignment we need to do, or here's the task we need to do. And everyone's just kind of responding to that. Every now and then you'll have to scroll up to look for the chat and go, what was the framework of that again? Very soon, Q3, we'll be able to pin a chat. Now, if you pin a chat, if we're in a chat together, there's only one pin for that chat message collectively. So if there's three of us, if I pin a chat, all of you see what I've pinned. And that's that. If you go and unpin that, then it's unpinned for all of us, right? So just to make that clear. Uh, somebody with deep pockets must have requested this feature, or maybe it's just a sake of streamlining how the functionality works across the different modalities. Perhaps that's it. Um, but I can see the use case. Uh, haven't had that requirement myself yet. And then what do we have here? This is interesting. So I try to set this up. Um, it's not surfaced. I am in public preview, but I haven't seen it just yet. So we all know about tags, right? Tags are great. So for instance, um, if it's really good, you can go and add like a tag and call the tag, I don't know, um, let's call it exercise. And every time I call up exercise, anyone who is subscribed to that tag will then get uh, a message, right? They'll get that message. Now in the past, and this is what's new, in the past, tags were configured per team, right? With the new tags API, the tags, these tags, they're actually a different set of tags, to be honest, but it doesn't really matter. This tags API surfaces a new kind of tag that exists within a chat message. So if you look at the screenshot over here, we're in chat, we're calling up an, a tag called HR, and that then will send out a message. It's kind of like a delegation group almost. It's a group of people that are named according to they, they follow that tag. You actually add them. So when we're creating the tag, you add the names and there they go. I don't know, what is that? That's probably closer aligned to like mail delegation, or not delegation, uh, distribution groups. It's kind of similar to that, isn't it? From a chat perspective because you're then chatting to the group name or the tag, and then all three of those persons will get that message. I like that. That's clever. That's nice. And uh, it, it'll be, yeah, I'm sure it'll be welcome. Now, that's the end of the slides I have. But what I do want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about some new and upcoming features. And I'm kind of on time, aren't I? Yeah, somewhere there. No, not really. Where's my window? Just bring my window back. Uh, you got a few, a few minutes up your sleeve. I do, I do, I do. Uh, we'll just close that over there. Close that over there. Okay, 
got a few minutes up here, Steve. That's good. It's because we're so used to being in person and asking questions, being interactive and stopping and grabbing a pizza. And oh, <laughs> This is the new world. Right. So um, there's a pretty cool feature. There, there's quite a bunch of new features coming, right? Uh, of course. And there's a um, – I've been tracking the feature sets for MTR on Android, MTR on Windows, and Surface Hub. Now, at the moment, I can't actually share that with you because of, you know, NDAs and so on. But what I can say is when you compare those three brands of features, what I can see is MTR on Windows today has the most features in the meeting room space. The least is Surface Hub. But MTR on Android is getting there really quickly. They're chipping off on a list. I've got a list of about let's call it about 20, 20 features I measure on. And on that list, we're looking at, uh, I would say, two or three new features month on month. So you can see, I'm, I'm guessing here, I'm going to stick my hand up and go, I reckon um, by first quarter next year, we'll have feature parity between Android and uh, Windows on MTR. That's exciting news. That's really cool. It does mean that when you're buying stuff now, you've got to think about it. You know, you want to buy a Windows-based system. Do you? What do you do? With that in mind, one of the key things I feel is missing on the Android platform is something called MTRP. So MTRP P is um, Microsoft Teams Rooms Premium. That's that ser service uh, that um, basically allows Microsoft mm -hmm to look after your room system. It's a it's a reactive service, but you basically pay Microsoft 50 US dollars a month, and they've got some people in the back end who look after stuff reactively. There, there are a few organizations who will layer on top of that some more smarts and make it proactive. That's available today. You just need to do a little bit of homework to find out who they are. If you're interested, hit me up after this. But what I would like to do perhaps next time is do a session on what is MTRP and why should you care? Because that, that could be uh, possibly quite interesting. And then just seeing, uh, I think it was, was that Peter's name? We just popped up there. I think Peter, I just saw a chat from you. Peter reminded me, uh, Peter, where is he? Peter Braun, there we go. Reminded me of uh, a, a little uh, feature that's on its way, that's on its way. Uh, Andrew, you know about this. Now that I've seen it in the wild, I know it's no longer under NDA, so I can talk about it. And that is the ability to rename Teams. Uh, today, if you rename Teams, you rename just the visual aspects of the team within Teams. The SharePoint site, well, not so much. It stays on the original created name. There's nothing you can do about it. You try and screw with it, it breaks, right? That's the bottom line. You just can't get around it. Microsoft have been playing with bits and pieces for a while. We've seen them do all sorts of interesting things. Um, I think it's out in the next month or so is when it should be out, when it'll be, it'll probably be out as part of uh, public preview first. But the constraints or the, the expense of it is that any teams you already have, you're out of luck, they won't comply. But any new teams you create after this has been pushed out, if you rename them, it'll rename the SharePoint site as well, the back end, mm. and that'll be really cool. So I think um, that's going to be something that's uh, much waited for. Mm. Right. Now, that's that's kind of um, that's kind of the length and breadth. I just want to go through and see if there's any questions I might have missed. I see there's a few chats mm. there, so it may take me a moment just to get through those. Um, yeah, you need a you need a assistant, Keith. Something that'll just type out what you say, you know. Right. So uh, let's see what do we have there. Do you know about the timeline when Surface Hub will catch up? <laughs> um. So how do I answer this? So for Surface Hub, um. Surface Hub is no longer considered as a true meeting room solution. It's a collaboration solution. So 
I think Surface Sub will break away on its own in terms of that. I don't think Surface Sub's ever going to have feature parity with the MTR systems. And simply because what Microsoft have done recently, and you may have seen this already, is that you can pair a Surface Sub to an MTR, right? So when you join the meeting from MTR, the Surface Sub joins as well and becomes your digital whiteboard. I know, that's very, very sad. I know, I know a very expensive one. I, I get it. I totally get it. But that's kind of what I'm seeing. And let me tell you where the problem lies. If you have an, a Surface Hub today and you've put it into a nice big room, what is the problem people have? It's a great collaboration space. It's got really nice, clear you know, um, real estate on the screen and so on. Where the wheels come off is if you stick it in a room and you expect it, and let's say the room's 8, 9, 12 meters, the microphone and speakers, whilst they work, we all know that it works versus it works well are two different things. And all you have to do is put four gigs of RAM in your PC and you'll see, even though you can run Windows, it works. It's hardly the kind of experience you want, is it? So with, with Surface Hub, everything self-contained, to, to give Surface Hub the ability to deal with that sort of room case properly, we have to break out. We have to start giving it better speakers, better microphones, better cameras. Now it starts becoming really, really expensive. So the use case of Surface Hub is specifically, yes, it can do meetings to an extent, but like it doesn't, it doesn't, um, I think, what is it? Three by three is the maximum on Surface Hub today with video. Whereas the others are already earmarked for the fourth quarter to go seven by seven. So they're just, they're just accelerating way past that. So. Surface Hub collaboration, think collaboration if you're thinking Surface Hub. I'm seeing less and less people buy Surface Hub for meeting rooms and more and more people buying them for collaboration. So if that answers your question. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Yeah, so uh, again, the question there about renaming of teams and channels yeah i i was under the impression it was both but i i will have to go and double check that um whether the renaming would be both and what else we got there i think that's kind of it that's kind of it is there any other questions are there any other questions you wanted to raise no oh there we go who sent that through matt Whiteboard for Surface Hub, whiteboard virus, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Uh, um, no, I haven't really played with whiteboards a lot. Andrew, do you know much about what? I mean, I've played with them within the team from my desktop, and I do use them for that a lot because from a desktop perspective, it makes sense for me. I just put my, you know, my whiteboard into the meeting over there. Andrew, you know anything else? I'm not a massive user, but if you wanted to unmute, we can have a conversation about it just to kind of understand exactly the question. Yeah, um, you can hear me. Eh? Yep. Yeah, I just got confused. Um, as you can see in that chat list, there's more whiteboards than you think. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's like the Microsoft Store whiteboard, which was a thing that you downloaded and used, and yeah. that had certain feature set. And then they had whiteboard for the web, which is a browser based thing. And it's a bit unclear what's used when you're inside a Teams meeting. Gotcha. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of trying to design something for an MTR system with a, mm -hmm. a touchscreen at the front of the room. And the, the customer wants to use whiteboard. I, um, I thought that the, originally in Teams, it was, I mean, it's always been the web-based client that Teams has used, but I think they've invested a lot more in the web experience to get teams up to par. So I'm I mean it might be a variation of the web experience and sometimes the web yeah. the, the native web experience might have more features than what they expose in teams, but it's using the same kind of engine, I suppose, behind the scenes. That's my understanding. And then I know that is the store app like you say, but I th that's been evolving over time as well. But yeah, like all Microsoft products, it's kind of different teams looking after different apps and it's yeah, yeah a bit all over yeah, the, the place. The whiteboards 
it's uh, it's about to get a, a revamp. I think it's coming either the end of this month or, or next month as well. But it's, it is it is as you say, it is a difference. The uh, the one that's built into Teams is a is a cut down version of the real one. It's more like the web one. Um, wow. But it's if you have users who use things like um, Post-it notes, like Kanban boards and stuff like that, um, you can redirect them and share the the store app whiteboard which gives you a whole lot more features the ability to group post-it notes to color code post-it notes you just don't get that in the teams version yet but as i said that that update is coming i think it's either the end of this month or next month to revamp that as well and so there's a lot of changes coming that they gotcha. haven't been quite forthcoming about either oh nice yeah no, that's, that's a good point so we're going to get the full web experience in teams but that's a good point that you mentioned is that that teams does actually redirect you to the store app doesn't it if you i think you were right that maybe inside teams you get the web whiteboard for the web mm -hmm. um and, and as the other person said that's under development coming with um sticky notes yeah. and, and whatnot but yeah, i just found yeah. it a bit, a bit confusing yeah like everything yeah. in microsoft world eh? there's <laughs> so many friggin things going on yeah. in different teams and they eventually get into alignment but um it's always a mess to start with eh? yeah thank you right okay so um right so let's move on to what everyone's been hanging around for and, and the good news is we were up at i think we we're up at 45 participants earlier and of course as we finished off and started talking about you know bits and pieces and answering questions that number's nearly halved you know what that means? We're that means that, that's, that, that, no, that means they miss out on the price. Come on, Andy. Jeez. Okay. So, um, what so, we would like to do? Go on, Andy. I think this is. Your oh, I was just going to say. So, um, of course, if you work for Jabra, you should probably rule yourself out. But use your own discretion to rule yourself out. We, Paul and I are going to rule ourselves out. Uh, I mean, maybe if you're a Justy that works for a competitor for Jabra, you might want to rule yourself out, but I'm going to leave it up to you. You guys make the judgment, but we can't ship internationally. So if there's any international guests here, we've tried that in the past. It's a pain in the bum. It costs a fortune and we gave up. Yeah, so yeah. you need to be based in New Zealand and we will courier it to you. Um, and basically, do you want to... Yeah, so, so Dan, Danny's also said thanks, Danny. Danny said if you're from Ingram, you're going to get spanked, so you're not allowed to be in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Danny. <laughs> right, okay. So um, you all know how to use the chat feature, right, within uh, this session, so of course. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask a question, and, and, and I'll let Andrew ask the question. But just before we do, the first person with the correct answer to the question in the chat, in the chat, right? So it's going to be typing yep. here. First person with the correct answer in chat will be our winner. Now, I just want to point out, <laughs> if, if you've won something uh, very recently, again, just keep in mind that uh, we want to share the love. You know, especially Jabra has been so generous. And thank you again to the folks at Jabra for helping us out with this. Right, Andrew. Andrew, you ready for your uh, question? All right. Hopefully it's not too mean. Uh, hopefully you were paying attention when we showed you that slide around the Evolve 265. Um, I've picked a reasonably obscure question, but um, hopefully you were paying attention. I might have to change the question if not, but you can always just throw guesses out there until you get it. Uh, and I'll give you a clue as we go on. But how, what was the speaker cone size in millimeters inside the headset? <laughs> mm. So right. we're looking for the size in mils. Um, and as we get answers, I might start throwing some clues out there. Um, I'm going to say Russell was pretty close with his original guess before he even knew the question. So I'll, I'll give you that as a clue. So nice one, nice one, Russell. You're really, really close. Come on, Russell, have another go. Okay. There we go. This. We've got it. We've got it. And the answer Matt, is? Matt from Vodafone, 40 millimetres. Quick Google. <laughs> I think that was the first one. We're getting I'm just I'm just double checking that now. Oh, I don't know, maybe maybe David. Maybe oh my god, there's too many coming popping up. We need to oh my gosh. 
Okay, I'm, I might have jumped nice again here. Who do you see first uh, there? Um... Yeah, it'd be interesting if it's in different order. I actually see, um, I think, Keith, maybe. Yeah, so do I. I see Keith as first as well. Did, any, any arguments from, from the audience? <laughs> do you want to contest our decision? Um, well, I'm there, and you gave it to me, but I reckon it was Keith. Yeah, yeah. Got yeah, the, the chat was, was just the chat was just it's going exploded. bananas. I didn't even see all those other ones. <laughs> oh, great stuff, man! Uh, Paul and Andrew, okay. um, we'll make uh, we'll make one available for for Keith and Matt as a as a. Oh my goodness! You guys oh, are yeah. awesome, Chris. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Brilliant. Not you, TK. I saw you answer that question. <laughs> right. So so. Um, Keith, we'll give you, you a need to make some noise about that. Uh, and so those of you who have uh, landed yourself that beautiful little headset, do us a favor. Do uh, put something up on LinkedIn. Do, uh, you know, call out Chris and the team at Jabra for um, their generosity and their support. Thank you so much, guys. Absolutely will do. Brilliant. We might ask yeah. for a photo of you sporting your headset or something, maybe. I For those of you who want, just can you just DM me and uh, I can collect your uh, your uh, shipping details so we can share that with Chris. Or, or perhaps, Chris, if you want to drop your email address in the chat, they can just email you direct. Yeah, I'll do that now. Awesome. Yeah, that's not, not a silly idea. Yeah, th thanks again, um, Chris, Jabra, Ingram. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. Now, on a different note, <laughs> uh, as always, um, you might have noticed that I've started building a bit of a motet behind me, just ever so um, so slightly. Right, so this is my uh, my work from home setup, and I'll just tilt my camera just a little so you can get a, a good feel for what's going on over there. Yeah, no, it's not a it's not a fake background. All all that hardware is real, <laughs> and most of it works. Most most of it works. And this is the stuff I've collected over the years, reviewed, removed, upgraded, patched, swapped out, and all that kind of stuff. So I just want to say thank you to all the Disties for their support over the years. And if you see something that's not there, just let me know. I'll be happy to oh, see. I thought you were going to say we can choose one. <laughs> it's, it's like being at the carnival. I'm going to throw my tennis ball at the item I want, and you're going to ship it to me. Yeah, if only. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm quite proud of my collection. Um, I, oh, I even be, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Put myself some of the old Siemens phones from when I was uh, at Siemens. Thank you, Doug, if he's around. There he is. Thank you, Douglas. Pleasure, Paul. Much I've appreciated. Actually, I've actually got a couple other bits for you as well. I forgot that I had them in a different bag. So. Oh, that's what I like to hear. That's what I, guys. That's that's. Uh, I actually sent a, a message to to Laura as well at uh, Polly and went, hey, I used to have a CX-100. You don't have one laying around here. Those will be scarce. <laughs> These, I don't uh, even remember them. Yeah. Do you remember in the beginning when those original products, I mean, I've got a CX-300 up there. Thanks to you, Andy. Do you remember somebody donating you a box of CX-300? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember that. That was um, someone from SecureCom, Matt, I think it was. Yeah, it's still yeah. that one's still Polycom branded, so uh, beautiful, eh? Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so what's happening in your parts of the world, guys? How are you coping with uh, being locked down? How's that working for you? Hey, I used to have one of those, Keith. Sorry that I interrupt myself. Um, I had a Callista. Andy, I think you had one I've as got, well. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got that. I've got that just down there. Actually, I can see that. Yeah, I wonder what happened yeah, to my not on display. Those were they were a great idea back in the day. And then um I remember a few years ago I pulled it out again because I thought the whole lapel mic was quite there was nobody else does a lapel mic, right? In in that sort of form factor. Yeah, yeah, there is, there is. Yeah, that was was that the Callisto, was it? Yeah, I think, that's I think right, it was, that's yeah. Right. Yeah. I never uh yeah, been used in a while. Hey but Diana, no. if you're still there. Do you have any idea where I got those cool headset holders from? Yeah, so um, that was something that was sent to me, those headset holders, just uh, not too long ago. Uh, yes, that was Anthony. 
Anthony, if you're there, I don't know if he's there, but thanks, mate. It was great. <laughs> uh, I, I was trying to get hold of those, uh, even trying to ship them from um, from AliExpress from China. It was just, nah. And I know Mr. Horrocks has got one as well. You do see that I have space for one, David. Just uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we gave a few away last time we met in person, yeah, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We did. That was Anthony and the team from Logi. Yeah. They, uh, they brought a bunch yeah, of those around. Yeah. And it, originally, I was like, hey, I'm not sure how that's going to go, but it worked out great. I can't see your T-shirt, though. Where's your T-shirt, David? You'll have to wear it next time and turn your video on. That's right. That's right. Hey, thanks, guys, for those of you dropping off. That was awesome. Um, I think it's now time. Yes, it, that's a scotch, isn't it, TK? I'm going to... I'm gonna, See your scotch with my beer. Oh, very good. Very good. Look at that, eh? I've just got kombucha. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, it well, is what we, it is, man. Yeah. Thank, hey, thanks Andy, again, so after Come this, on. after this, we'll, we'll make the slides. I'll just merge my, my few slides with yours, and we'll uh, make that available, and uh, we've recorded the session as well, so we'll chuck it up somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll edit it and, and get it up there, yep. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and thanks again to Jabra for your generosity and your support. Thank you so much. Over and out. Cheers, everyone. Take care.